Thanks everyone for joining us to look at our six-legged friends in the garden. We're going to be talking about their importance in your garden as well as in the environment. So we may as well talk about the ant on the right-hand side there, the banded sugar ant. It's an omnivore. It might feed on the honeydew from sap-sucking insects, but on another occasion it might eat an insect. So it's part of the, the clean-up crew in the garden. Ants are often described as being ecosystem engineers. They do a lot of good in the environment and also in gardens. I did spend a, a decade or so working in agricultural entomology with the Victorian Department of Agriculture. That's where I really started to learn about insects as I would be going out into, into crops, broad acre kind of crops, and looking at insects. You are studying the pests, but you're also looking at all the beneficial insects that may be helping to control it and learning to identify them and learning what else is there and whether they're of any interest or not. And I did spend quite some time working with an integrated pest management consultancy as well. And I'll be talking about what integrated pest management app actually is, because a lot of what I'm talking about is based on the principles of that. I do have a couple of books. Backyard Insects is a basic book on insects, what the major groups are, how you tell one from the other. So it's not necessarily aimed at gardeners, although it could be very useful. But the book on the right is much more geared towards gardeners. And some of the principles that we're talking about here are in the opening chapters of the book. What we're going to be talking about is the importance of insects in gardens and in the environment generally. So to know how that works, what is it that they do? And we'll be looking at biodiversity. And as you'll soon learn, in terms of diversity, insects have got that one covered. And then we'll look briefly at um, pesticides, how that fits or doesn't fit into the mix. And then if you're attracting a whole lot of insects into the garden to create habitats for lots of insects, don't you end up with more, more pests? Not necessarily. And then I'll wrap it all up with a little case study done in my own garden. And it makes us look at that insect on the right there, which is known as the common brown earwig. It is not a pest. It is a predator. It's a, an Australian native insect. And yes, it's in Melbourne. It's quite widely distributed. You can easily tell the difference between one of these and a European earwig, which are the ones that cause problems in people's gardens, that brownish-orange triangle on its back immediately distinguishes it from its European cousin, because it doesn't have that orange triangle. Insects are important. Why are they important? What is it that they do? They certainly are important. If all the insects disappeared overnight, most of the Earth's terrestrial ecosystems would collapse, because insects underpin most of those ecosystems. And the first thing we think of that insects do is pollination, because we see insects coming into our garden on, and feeding on the flowers. And we've known from when we were children about bees and butterflies and things that feed on flowers and how that's great. Pollination is not just done by bee, not just the European bee. And as you know, probably know, we have hundreds and hundreds of species of native bees, and it's not just them. Any insect that visits a flower is a potential pollinator. Just some are more efficient than others. And the efficient ones are those that are either hairy or covered in scales uh, like moths and butterflies are. The other thing to remember is um, from an insect's point of view, pollination is accidental. They're just going to the flower to feed on it, to feed on the nectar or the pollen or both. From the plant's point of view, they've produce these nice attractive things to bring the insects in to make the pollination happen. So pollination is one of those things that insects do. It's vital out there in the ecosystem. Sure, there are a whole lot of things that don't need insects for pollination, such as all the grasses and so forth that are pollinated by the wind. Lots of plants do. Insects are also food for other animals. Insect feeding birds and bats and fish and reptiles and amphibians, and they also feed on each other. So the predators feed on others and so forth. Then you have the parasites that breed in other insects or on them, and so they're part of the food chain. Because there's so many different species of insects, there's about a million of them that we know so far, and there's probably about five million, you can see why they are so important. There's no other animal that is that diverse and does some of these things, or all of these things. Recycling 
is another one. Around about now, we'll introduce our bronze cockroach here. This is a native cockroach. This is not one of the ones that you find under your fridge in the house. All of the pest cockroaches are introduced from somewhere else. Native cockroaches are not pests. They're part of the recycling mob. So they're breaking down leaf litter and they're rummaging under things and breaking down other organic matter. So they are desirable rather than things to be feared. And there's a whole lot of other insects that do it, uh, that, sorry, help in the recycling. Uh, dung beetles are one. They're burying dung, so they're returning dung produced by animals, mammals, into the soil uh, to recycle the nutrients. You have all the insects in compost bins, nothing to worry about. They're just helping to break it down. Even things like Drosophila, like those little flies, the larvae are just helping break it down. It's all good. And then um, ants. Yeah, we've already talked about ants, but this is yet another thing that they do. They're part of the cleanup squad because they carry uh, dead insects back to their back to their nests. So lots and lots of insects are involved in recycling and beetles that break down dead wood and so forth, and on and on it goes. So they're very important and desirable in the garden. Seed dispersal is something that uh, insects do, uh, particularly ants. I know some plants drop seeds that have their own little wings and they flutter away from the parent plant. The idea is, is to get the seeds as far away from the parent plant as possible so it doesn't swamp it. And so in particularly like Australian native plants, there's hundreds and hundreds of species that have a tiny little uh, fatty body known as an eliosome on the seed and ants love it. So a native plant like a wattle drops the seeds, the ants come along and they pick up the seeds and they take them back to the nest where they feed on the uh, the little fatty body and then dispose of the rubbish, in other words, the seed, um, down the back of the nest or they might carry it out of the nest and then bury it under leaf litter. They're not going to leave it lying around the nest because the seed might attract something else that they don't want around. So they're effectively planting the seeds. Something else insects do is they're one of the critters that helps to aerate soil. So anything that digs a, a burrow or a hole is helping to aerate the soil. And some are better than others. For example, termites and ants in northern Australia, particularly in the arid zone, they replace the work done by earthworms. Insects are pretty important. One little footnote, uh, not all termites are pests. There's about 300 species, a handful are. Most of them feed on grass. Diversity, as I said, insects have got it in spades because they are more diverse than any, any other creature on earth. They account for about three quarters of all species of animals. Because insects are so important and because there are so many of them, if they were to decline in numbers, that would be really bad. Probably read some of this stuff about how insects are declining all over the world and we might lose our insects and da 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 da. We don't really know. We know that. Some insects in some places are declining because they've been studied. You can't just extrapolate from a small study to the whole planet. But most scientists agree that things are moving in the wrong direction. We just don't know how fast and how broad that is. Gardening is part of the solution. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, you can't recreate lost or declining ecosystems in your backyard, but you can keep the diversity of insects going in your area and maybe amplify that. And so how do you do that? Well, to attract a whole lot of insects in, the best thing to do is grow a whole lot of different sorts of plants, everything from ground covers to a, a tree. And you need flowers for nectar. We've already talked about uh, the ones that arrive and help to pollinate. But some of those insects are things like parasitic wasps that need nectar to be able to lay fertile eggs, meaning to do their job as a parasite of another insect. And that other insect might be a pest. Flowers are terrific. And so they need to have uh, nectar that's you know relatively easy to get a hold of and depending on the insects. Some of the native bees really like to get into those sort of tubular flowers and rummage around in it. And then flowers of different colors and different sizes and shapes. So little tiny flowers with little nectar wells in the middle are great for really small parasitic wasps. And I'll show you that in the end when, when I do the little uh, case study. 
Then for bigger insects, so your sort of open flowers like daisy type things and things like the humble tea tree is fantastic. They've got lots of nectar in, in a nectar well in the middle. And then things that flower at different times of the year. So basically for all the warmer months, there is something flowering in your garden is a really good place to start. We're learning more and more about this sort of stuff, about which flower attracts which insect and so forth. I don't want to sit here and say plant X, Y and Z to attract this native bee and that wasp and no one really has drilled down to that sort of level. But there are a few comments I could make. One is about the blue banded bee. It used to be thought that they were pretty much only attracted to blue flowers or mauve flowers or maybe purple ones. And I made that mistake myself and it appears in my book. The truth is they're attracted to a whole lot of flowers and they will use whatever flower is there that they can access the nectar from. And in my garden, it's got a whole lot of natives and lots of other things as well. The flower that is most attractive to the blue banded bees is a red salvia. I've got a little line there saying pests can spread with plants. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. If you're worried about pests, try not to bring them into the garden in the first place on plants that you've bought in the nursery. And avoid planting susceptible plants and grow fewer conditions is another mantra of mine. If you've got a plant that's happy in your soil, and happy with the watering regime that you've got and happy with the climate, it's less likely to drop dead if it gets a fungal disease or be severely damaged by pest attack. And if it is damaged by pest attack, it's likely to spring back fairly quickly. So I forgot to press the button again to have a look at this beetle here. The, the green carob beetle, we're talking about diversity and so forth. There are lots of these sorts of beetles. They're fairly sinister looking. They're fairly flattened. This one's quite brilliant color, as you can see. And it's got these massive jaws. That's because it's a predator. These things are highly desirable. They're nocturnal, though. So you're unlikely to see them running around in your garden, but you might find them if, you're, if you roll back a log or something like that. Don't squash them. They're a good guy. I just want to talk a little bit more about pests spreading with plants. This is a classic example and one of many where a, a plant, in this case a lily pilly, that has become quite popular, particularly for small gardens and courtyards, because there's all these new varieties that are very small. Unfortunately, these plants come from where this beetle lives, which is northern New South Wales and southern Queensland. Now, the plant on the left there that's all chewed up is in a courtyard in Melbourne. This little beetle is now a pest in Melbourne. There would have been uh, perhaps parasitic wasps, but almost certainly ladybirds up there that were used to tackling these things, probably feeding on the larvae. That's that grubby thing down the bottom. But something that really wasn't so much of a pest up there is a pest down here. And so this is how a lot of pest insects have been created. So be wary of what you plant and anything you bring into the garden, check it, make sure it's okay. Some people even do a little sort of quarantine thing, stick it in a corner somewhere, don't plant it immediately, wait a week or so, see if there's any damage on there that, that's appearing, find out what it is. So try not to introduce the problem in the first place, which leads us to this lovely topic. What is a pesticide? It's a catch-all term that includes insecticides, fungicides, miticides, herbicides, and sometimes they're used interchangeably, and I've been guilty of that myself. In terms of insecticides, whether it's synthetic or organic or natural, they are all pesticides. They are all designed to kill something. That leads on to the next part, which is the notion of trying to get rid of something, as in eradicate it. You may well go out into your backyard with your trusty bottle of spray, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, and kill off some pest in your backyard, but you haven't really eradicated them because they're probably next door. It's really difficult. I mean, think about what's going on right now and with the varroa mite in New South Wales. It's really hard. They're throwing lots of money at it, lots of people. And also look at what's happening with the red fire ant up in Queensland that's now encroaching into northern New South Wales. So it's very difficult, even with all those resources. 
The other thing that can happen is if you really hammer insect pests is you create others. If you use something that's broad spectrum, as in it's registered against a range of insects, including things like oil sprays, you may kill all the predators as well, or at least the parasites, particularly the little parasitic wasps. And at the same time, you might kill a bunch of other parasitic wasps that might have been suppressing a different pest that you haven't seen yet. But be careful using anything really and follow the label, read what it's registered against and note what it's not registered against. On the left, just for your entertainment, an interesting looking beetle is a fairly common, usually associated with wattles. It's a, basically a type of weevil and you use the word weevil and people panic and go, well, it's obviously it's a pest. Nope. Just one of a zillion native insects that feeds on wattles, doesn't do any particular damage. I see them all the time and never see a, a stressed wattle. So moving on, we need to look at what integrated pest management is, because much of what I'm talking about is based on the principles of integrated pest management. And this was a thing that was developed way back in the 1960s. This is not something new. This was developed um, by scientists. The idea is, in terms of insecticides, you use them as a last resort, not your first option, should be the last one. Because what was happening was, insects were building up resistance to the chemicals that were registered against them. And so they'd bring something else onto the market, stronger or more targeted, and then they'd develop resistance to that. There was this sort of chemical arms race going on, trying to control insect pests. They developed integrated pest management, and the key to it is really simple. Monitoring, going out into your garden and seeing what's going on on a regular basis. Now, keen gardeners do that anyway. So you're not suddenly surprised by the back corner that you haven't checked for three months and you've gone down there and the plant's half eaten. You would have seen it begin and may be able to, able to do something to stop it in its tracks. Monitoring is, is key, and I spent years doing that out in these crops and wandering around and seeing what's there, seeing if there's any damage, seeing if, if I could find any pests, so you'd actively go looking for them, and then seeing if the beneficial insects were there or there was evidence that they were there. I mean, I can show you some evidence in a sec. So that was the first step. And then what else can we do? So these are like what they call cultural controls. Should we be using a different variety? Should we be planting at a different time? Should we change our fertilizer regime and have things with new growth at different times of the year and that sort of thing? And then the next step was to look for those beneficial insects that I was talking about, so the predators and the parasites, and seeing whether they were controlling so you see whether the struggle is tipping one way or the other. Then after consulting my colleagues, some advice would be given to the grower about what to do next. And often it was nothing. This stuff actually works. I've got the word tolerance there in my little list. And you might think, now, what the hell is he talking about? Two types of tolerance. How much damage can the plant tolerate before you need to do something? So from a, a commercial point of view, is it going to cost more? than what I'm going to lose if I let it go. From a gardener's point of view, you know the plants and you think, well, I know that if these caterpillars or whatever keep going, it's gonna cause considerable harm to the plant. And then you might wanna do something about it. And the other type of tolerance is how much, <laughs> how much plant damage can a gardener tolerate? If you can be a little more tolerant of things, life won't be so difficult. I've spoken to people who, like if they have one leaf that's eaten or one insect that has dared to feed on one rose bloom and they're out nuking the garden, that's not the way to do it. That's what used to happen way back. You can get the idea that it's, it's no quick fix, integrated pest management, because it's quick fixes that got us into trouble in the first place, which is why integrated pest management was developed. If you do go the quick fix route, you'll cause often cause more problems. When in doubt, keep it out. Of course, I'm talking exclusion to 
use some sort of a net or exclusion bags and all these, you know, tunnels and things, lots and lots of products that are available, or you can make your own. You'll see one in, in just a sec. Some sort of netting or something like that is a really good option. You can even use bird netting because if you did, it would stop wingless grasshoppers like these ones, which if they get into any number, like lots of them start wandering into your vegetable garden, for example, they really like lettuces. So they'll eat them to the ground in a day. To think all you've got to do is put a little net over the lettuces and it won't happen. And you don't have to do anything else. So it's a preventative thing. It's, there's no sort of running around trying to pick grasshoppers off or, or, uh, or shoo them away with a hose or something like that. You don't have to bother. The net has done it all for you. Let's look at my little case study. My nemesis is the cabbage white butterfly. And out where I live, near the Grampians, when cabbage white butterflies arrive in my garden, it's not one or two, it's not ten, it's hundreds at a time, in clouds. Because nearby, just a few kilometres down the road, are a whole lot of canola crops, which are basically giant cabbages. And there's a whole lot of what's called forage brassica, which are basically small, I guess, swede type brassicas. So they're for the sheep. So they're grown... Uh, through spring and summer. That's like peak butterfly time. So they get a, several generations through building up in numbers all the time. Then they go somewhere else, like into my garden. I got lots of lovely photos of various things in my, in my book here. All that came out of my garden one, one year when I left the net off to see what would happen. So I could get some really lovely photos of caterpillars chewing the hell out of my brassicas. And then, of course, I got all the predators and all the parasites as well. Let's reverse that and put the net back on. And that's all I do. Um, I have these sticks made from bits of old branch that I upturn old pots on or tubes like these ones. And you keep the net up off the plants because they'll stick their abdomens through that. They can't squeeze through it, but they'll put their abdomen through and lay eggs onto the plants. So make sure there's a, a nice gap above so that they can't do that. And there it is, job's done. I'm keeping my nemesis out of that little patch and my brassicas are safe, except aphids can get through. So they get through and they start breeding. But of course, the mesh is big enough to let the parasites through. And that's what happens. On the right, you can see a parasitized aphid. It is now dead. It is called an aphid mummy. And inside, a little wasp is about to emerge out because it's gone through its life cycle inside the aphid. And if you look at some of those other aphids there, they look suspiciously enlarged. They've probably got wasp larvae developing inside. Now, as soon as I see that, just one, I know the aphids are under control and I can just walk away. I have never had to spray against aphids on these plants. It works a treat. Let me show you, encapsulated in one picture, what I'm talking about. In its formative years, the, this garden idea of mine, up against that fence now, in between the fence and the, the bed, and there's a whole lot of other flowering perennials that are there, uh, natives, all of them. Various types with different size flowers. And what that one is there in the foreground, oh yes, I can make it bigger, is thryptamine. So that's the local one, thryptamine calicina. As you can see, covered in flowers. That was taken in uh, September a few years back, so around about now. They flower through winter uh, into spring. And so it's a perfect flowering plant for this time of the year if you've got brassicas that are finishing like those ones are there. And so I've taken the net off. You can still see my poles with their little upturned pots and things on them that was holding the net up. So I took the net off to take this photo. So you could actually see what was under the net and also see the thryptamine. Yes, there were aphids on these plants, not in any particular high number that I would even bother with doing anything because the wasps were doing it all. They were flying from the brassica plants across to this thryptamine and feeding on those little flowers and then flying back and hunting more aphids. And backwards and forwards they went. This stuff works. Just in those few pictures there, I'm controlling pretty much all the pests that would ever try and get onto brassicas.
In summary, diversity is a great thing to have in the garden, and it's also a good thing for the environment. Even just from the point of view to make it work, you really have to minimise the number of chemicals used in the garden, therefore that's good. Planting a diversity of plants, that's good because that'll bring lots of different sorts of insects. Uh, yeah, some of those insects are going to be pests, but some will be beneficial insects. But, you know, most of them are just benign. They're wandering around doing their thing. They might nibble on a plant here or there, not cause any particular harm. Uh, they might breed there. They might move on. Who knows? Try to grow for your conditions is a good thing to do because it really helps in terms of if you do get a great bunch of insects come in that are plant feeders, that your plant will recover from it fairly quickly. In terms of trying this integrated pest management thing, going out and looking is the key to making all this work. And I can't stress that enough to, to see what's going on, to learn as much as you can, to try to identify things as best you can. I can recommend a couple of books that, you know, I don't know if you've heard of them uh, that might help. But also, all jokes aside, there are some really good online resources like iNaturalist and only use pesticides as a last resort or not at all. Thanks very much, everyone.